Okay, I think we're going to start this. What? Is my mic on? This is a talk that I've done a couple of times, and when we have new employees, kind of give you the bigger picture of what's going on in our company and how everything works, and then you can ask questions. But mostly this is about... Okay, so first of all, some context. What does Backblaze do? Okay, so um, this is a chart that, that, that we created, and this is a chart that shows our whole company history. It starts over in 2007, which was a very lean year because I was here all alone, and uh, we didn't have a product, we didn't have any pricing, we weren't selling anything. So in 2008, I think, was our first revenue, which is absolutely hilarious. One of our first people who ever bought the product is a guy named Brian Beach. Um, he now is one of our most senior engineers, but he actually was excellent at the company. He's a friend of ours, and, and he actually put his credit card on. He was the first person. Tim Newfire, who's also a partner, um, claims that he was the first person because he used his credit card to get the test the billing system. Um, but Brian Beach was the first ex customer customer. Um, and then, oh, we moved around a little. So, um, and then if you can see, uh, this is the total amount of storage in our data center. And the pictures on the walls around here, if you, have, uh, if you haven't been to the data center, this is what the data center actually looks like. These are real life Backblaze employees in these pictures. And, and when we say this is the amount of storage in our data center, and we're now, uh, we're well past 600. I don't know what the current number is, but we're, we're on track to get an exabyte in, and this is stunning to everybody. This is really stunning to me, because when I started, it was like we were thinking about, you know, maybe we'll store four terabytes or something, you know, like we'll just do backups for friends or something. We have three sort of product lines that we think of in this company, and this talk is mostly about the personal backup. The very first product we ever did was the V1 personal backup uh, product. We don't call it V1 externally, but I think we should. Um, we, the, the second product line is definitely V2 externally, but V1 is a very specific application. It's unlimited storage per lap, for five dollars a month per laptop with a 30-day rollback history. It's a very specific product. Uh, we went to market with that product. Um, there is, uh, oh, it's funny, it says no sharing in the slide. We've just added a share file uh, feature in, in V1 since, since this slide was made. Uh, B2 is totally different than personal backup. It's stored on the same red pods that you can see in the photos around here. But B2 is you pay per byte. And we're completely agnostic as to what you store. With the personal backup product, we don't like to back up your OS because you can get that up from the original manufacturer. Um, but we, uh, you know, and stuff like that. We don't care what we store in B2 because we just bill you per byte. It's a completely, B2 is a much more, it's just an honest product. You know, there's a lot less worrying about um, averages and things like that. With B1, we really worry about what our average is. So, and, and just a history about why we, why we price it $5 a month unlimited. It wasn't to attract gigantic users. It was because uh, our relatives, my parents, people that are computer novices don't know what a byte or a terabyte is or a petabyte. They just don't know. So we wanted to remove sales friction. We wanted it to be just a no-brainer. So we priced it as $5 a month. Not, and, and they would say, well, what if I have an external driver? What if I add a photo? We didn't want to stress them out. We didn't want them to worry about prices going up over time or us trying to them. So it's $5 a month and it's unlimited. But that's not to attract big users, it's to make the pricing easy on people. Um, B2 is for professionals. It's for, it's for people who understand what a byte or a terabyte is. It's, it's for anyone who really understands it. It's for big servers. Um, it's for anything you want to use storage for. You, you have any policy you want on it. You can decide as a programmer, you know, what your policy is, or maybe your tool that you use, a third-party tool. But um, the B1 was, was um, the original product, and we introduced B2 in, maybe, was that 2015? Around, yeah. Around 2015? Yeah, and September. Okay, and then we also like to think of a third product line, which is business groups. Now, business group groups is a way of paying for other people's use of B1 and B2. The businesses had a very specific <coughs> problem. They didn't want to put an individual credit card down on, uh, for instance, a thousand desktops in their organization and get a thousand expensed, you know, uh, uh, bills for for it. So business groups allow one admin to pay for a thousand licenses, and it pays for both B1 and B2. It, it's B1 and B2 appeared inside your account that you created, the one true account that you created Backblaze, 
And, um, and business groups is actually a free feature. Uh, a lot of companies, when they say the word business, that means they charge more for it or something like that. For us, it's, it's absolutely free. Anyone can create a group. And we call it business groups because the most common group of people that use it are businesses. But it's also a family group. Like if you just want to pay for your kids, you give them each an individual email address. And then there's two, there's actually two types of groups. There's a managed group where you can actually prepare or restore on your kids' behalf or on your, on your if you're an IT guy, on your, uh, 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 one of your desktop customers' um, uh, laptops. But if it's an unmanaged group, all you're doing is paying them. And they still have to prepare their own restores. They have perfect privacy. So it, the, the product can be used in different ways. But business groups is a free feature. Um, they pay for the underlying stuff. They pay for V1 and V2. The group is just a way to pay for it. This is an example where it says there's one Backblaze account. You can enable V1. You can enable V2. And you can possibly enable groups inside of that one account. You can become a group administrator. You can use any combination of these. We don't care. Um, and we bill you, you know, appropriately for each one. All make sense? This is all, all what we do here? Okay. Originally, how do we do it? And what the pictures are around us in, in here are these red storage pots. So originally, we looked into, um, uh, we originally looked into like Amazon. We were going to store all the data on Amazon S3, and they were currently charging. Hold on, I need to get water. They were they were charging something like I think 15 cents a gigabyte. And there was just no way the math made sense. Um, and we, we added up what it cost to hook up a hard drive. And, um, and it was like, you know, one penny a gigabyte or something. And we just couldn't figure it out. And, we, and there were these other companies out there that would, like EMC, that would sell storage. But it was also very, very expensive. And one of the market things that people had missed out on the, the, the hardware manufacturers that's now being filled in better was um, uh, we needed very reliable storage, but we didn't need it to be that fast. And a lot of data, uh, our data isn't like a database. You don't need really fast access to all the data all the time. You usually back up, and then two years from now, you get your laptop stolen and you need to restore it. So it's this very slow, we, we don't need to access all of our data all the time, like sort of a database or really fast. And that market wasn't being serviced very well. So Tim Newfire and, and a couple of other people built the storage pods. The only thing in the storage pod that is backblaze is the sheet metal. We basically bent sheet metal in this form factor, and then we bought off-the-shelf components that you could buy at Fry's Electronics and filled it. And um, at the end price was something like, you know, one fiftieth what you could buy from EMC and things like that. So that made the whole business work. And we, we came up with a five dollar a month price point randomly. We kind of talked to friends and they at ten dollars a month some of them would go, Yeah, that sounds reasonable. And at five dollars a month people would go, Well, that's just a no brainer. Like I think that, that, that makes sense to me. So so we got really lucky. There's a variety of things that weren't brilliant. We just really got lucky. We were able to afford it because of the pods. And $5 a month was a price point people were willing to pay. A lot of people were willing to pay for the service. So um, these are the very first pods that were ever created. You can see how the, the faceplate um, had a different pattern than the modern ones. Um, this one, if you look really, really closely, you can see I, I was amazed. I thought we were going to print one of these sheet metal things, and the boards, you, you have to understand, there are all these screw holes on the, on the motherboards, and I thought there's no way they would get those offsets correct. The first time, I thought for sure something would be off. Everything, everything screwed together on the very first one. I couldn't believe it. But Tim had forgotten to leave a, a hole for the power button. So they took, they took a screwdriver and we just jammed it in there and bent it aside and broke some of these tabs and then, and then screwed it on. And then they fixed that in, in row two. So, um, but it was really amazing that a company of six people, seven people at that point, five people, seven people, could actually produce uh, a piece of hardware. It, it's literally, you just buy these components, you know. It's not completely as straightforward as that. We first tried to connect all the hard drives by USB because it was very inexpensive and we thought it made sense. And, and the USB spec, you're supposed to be able to plug in like 128 devices. And that's what the spec says. And you can definitely plug in three or four. But what you can't do is you can't plug in 45. And we don't know why. When you plug in 45, the USB bus freaks out. Uh, I understand if 
two didn't work. But I don't understand how four works and, and 45 doesn't. So we found a different technology, it's called SATA, and, and it ended up working. Um, what was the original capacity of the first pod? I think the first pod was one terabyte drives. Uh -huh. uh, so it was, and the original pods were 45 drives. <coughs> now we're producing 60 drive uh, chassis. These are um, rows of 15 drives. And originally those were organized into three rated arrays so that if you lost one drive, you didn't lose data. Right, and um, and uh, like on this picture that's up here, this is just a, an Intel motherboard, a power supply, and we actually had this was the very first one we fitted in with one power supply. You can buy super power supplies that are super powerful and can power the whole thing, but we actually bought two consumer power supplies for like a hundred dollars each, instead of one server power supply for a thousand dollars. So it was all about cost, but it was it's. It's not redundant. People saw the two power supplies. They, they might think it's redundant. It's actually, you lose either one and you lose the pod. So, so pods were still, uh, had a flaw. Um, they were great, and they got us bootstrapped up. But they had a flaw in that if one pod lost, for instance, a motherboard, you wouldn't lose any data, but you couldn't get it back for some period of time. And for the online backup product, that was actually okay. What would happen when you prepared to restore is it would take, you know, four or five hours anyway. We'd send you an email when it was ready. And these guys in the data center would run over and try to repair the pod and get it to come back up. And then the, the restore code would pass back over it. And the restorers would sleep until all the pods were up and stuff like that. Um, but what we realized, what, what, what was bantered about for a long time was the concept of a vault. A vault is where you strike the data instead of, um, I don't know how, if you guys know about RAID, but instead of, instead of striking the data across inside of one machine, where if you lose power to that one machine, you don't have access to the data while it's powered off. We strike any one byte or any one data, we strike it across these 20 machines. It's not important how it works, it's mathematics, it's about this many lines of code, it's not, it's not impossible to read or understand, but it's called read solomon encoding. And you can lose, through this math magic, you can lose any three out of the 20 pods. You just dump them in the ocean. And you can still recover 100% of your data back. And it doesn't matter which three you lose. That's the cool thing on math. A, 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 very, a very simple way to do this would have been to have the data stored in three different locations. Um, and then you, could, then you could lose even more pods. But this way is we felt the math worked out where we have never, ever, ever had data go down three Remember, if you lose three, you can still get all your data back. To this day, we've never lost three uh, pods at the same time. At the very most, we've lost two drives in a, in a, it was called a tome that that, uh, that is striped across across these machines. So we haven't even hit the ragged edge yet. When we lose the first drive and it dies, which happens every day, they replace 15 drives a day in the data center. There are 100,000 drives in the data center, and it's completely calm. Nobody wakes up. In the morning, a computer assigns the task to all the individuals in the data center that go to, you know, uh, uh, you know, data center four, go to row six, go down the hall, you know, go to this pod, pull it out, replace the drive. That's totally calm. When they lose two, though, in the same tool, people start waking up, people start driving toward the data center, it gets more exciting, and as I said, we've never lost three, but we can lose three. And then, you know, four, we actually suffer data loss. So we don't ever get there. Okay, so, um, okay, so the rest of this talk is about the B1 client and how it works. So if you have questions about B2, we can talk about that later or the account login or anything, but the B1 client is um, very, very, very simple, okay? And this is the B1 client backup flow. What happens is, a client, step number one, a laptop in the world wakes up once an hour and it asks, it says, I need somewhere to store my data. So it calls home to the, what we call the cluster authority, CA001. And it asks CA001, can you tell me somewhere in the world that I can store data onto the pods? And it assigns it a pod somewhere, a vault. And then it, it, the client, the laptop, hangs up and doesn't bother the CA again. It then contacts that pod directly. Um, we, because we invented this uh, ourselves and we own both ends of the protocol, we wanted it to be cheap, so we never bought any load balancers. Uh, we, 
it doesn't have any choke points in the system, and it turns out it's very inexpensive. Um, and, and it scales really well. We have 500,000 individual laptops backing up into our data center, and they have to call home and get the location of where there's free space in the data center. But um, other than that, you know, it doesn't have to do any more. The clusters, then, um, you're, you are bound, that's another unit of scale for our company. The clusters, the CA0, we have three clusters in the world right now. 000, 001, 002. Your account is bound to a cluster for life. It cannot move, it cannot migrate. Clusters are also regions. So when we open up um, uh, Europe, uh, either later this year or early next year, that will be in a new cluster, you know, 003, something like that. And your account is bound there, your data is bound there for life. It can't move between clusters. Uh, this means we have to stop putting people on a cluster when it starts to get loaded down and overloaded. But if you create a new account, we put it on 002, it's unloaded right now, and the, and the cluster, we have three digits, and we have plenty of space, and, and I've had to go through several times proving to people that this can go forever. There, there's no limits to the scale. Um, if you think we're gonna run out at 999 data centers, you're, you're wrong. We actually can use letters for the, the, the cluster for you. So it's not just, 000 through 999, it's, it's alphanumeric. You can go C, A, A, B, C. So, so we actually can keep going for you know, decades this way. Okay, so the first step is to ask where in the world I can store some data. And then the laptop backs up data to that vault for as long as it wants until either one, the vault crashes or goes offline. And or the vault fills up. Same thing, the vault can just hang up on a client. And then it's very uh, profoundly fault tolerant. The client then um, uh, goes, oh, I, I've lost my connection. I can't communicate to my pod anymore. Mm. So it has to go back to the cluster authority and ask for a new pod. Um, and that's how the system works. And so whenever, whenever a, a, a vault crashes or goes offline, or the guys in the data center just take it offline because they want to repair something in it, that's fine. The clients just bounce to a new location um, and start backing up data somewhere else in the data center. And then when the client is all done backing up and it's finished. Uh, at the end, the laptop has to go back to the CA and tell it where all the files are that it pushed. So, so there's a very, and we'll get to that, how, it, how that works in the next, but, but the first step is to ask where it should back up and then it backs up. And the only, buddy, the only person in the world that knows where all that happened most of the data center stateless was the client, and then at the end, the client uploads the list of where the files are to the cluster authority, and that's the that's the last step. Okay, so the final part of this talk, um, which can go on for for a very long time, um, uh, is is a is a description of the BZ done format. I'm going to try and get this all in one slide. Okay. Okay, um, uh, uh, the top is my quote, understand BZ done files and you understand Backblaze. That's no longer the case now that we have the B2 product line, but in the old days, this was, this was totally true. Um, okay, so, so I did not have the brain power or uh, the designer to do anything complicated. So every idea here is, this is the world's most simple format, and it's a log-based format. We never lose any information of anything that occurred in your backup ever. And what happens is, if you look at the very first line on this slide of what's called the busy done file, and why it's called a busy done file is, the first step that the client goes through is it comes up with a to-do list of all the files it's going to back up. And then when it's finished, I called it a done list because uh, I'm, I'm an idiot and, and done had the same number of letters as to do and that made all the files line up in, in my browser. Anyway, the point is it's, it's too late. That's why they're called done list. This is what the, what the laptop has done is, is represented in here. And it's an append only format. In other words, you never ever delete a line. It's illegal for these to, sh to shrink. They will never shrink. Anything that occurs is recorded in this history of events. And, and that's just been really valuable for us to figure out what went wrong. For instance, when you say, well, I didn't delete that file, then we can point to the exact moment the laptop decided to 
delete the file. Uh, and it, if it was four years ago, if it was 10 years ago, if it was 30 years ago, it's still going to be in there. So it, it, whenever we dive in, it's just been really nice to have that complete history. There are some side effects of having the complete history, which is as your backup gets older and older, it slows down. Um, uh, and there's generally, there's one of these busy done files for every day that your backup ran. And so for the first year, that means you only have 350 files. And 350 files is totally doable by any modern laptop computer on an SSD. In your 10th year, that's 3,500 files. And that started to slow down. And so what we recommend is that you uninstall, reinstall, and repush from scratch whenever you want your, your, your backup to speed up again. Now, five years, so, and, and, Originally, when I built this, I went, shoot, if we're in business in three years, I'll be lucky. This will totally scale to 1,000 files, you know, you know, three years, and, and it'll all be fine. Well, we've got backups now that are like 11 years old, and, and it's getting kind of slow, but it still works. There's nothing wrong with it, and we have people with 100 million files in this system. But here's how it works. The very first line you can see up here has there's this first column. Uh, it says column zero, and there's a description of each of the columns below in this. It's on Whistler, and I can also talk to anybody who's interested in it through it. The first column is five, which means the, the line version number. It's how we're going to parse the rest of the line. Five means we screwed this up four times, but this one's final. And this slide, I think, was done in 2014. We haven't changed it from, from line version five. We finally got it right. It's beautiful. It's perfect. It'll never change. Okay. <laughs> So that, that'll, you'll see nothing but fives your whole career here. Okay, column number one, the very first file is if you decide to push a file. Now, the file name that you've decided to push into the data center is on the far, 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 far right column. It says column 13 is the file name. Um, this, is, uh, this file format is absolutely one of the reasons it's so fast and so much faster than most other systems is there's absolutely no encoding allowed. So this is UTF-8. But all of the columns, except for the very last column, are, uh, are, are, would, would work in US ASCII. And then the very last column is UTF-8. So it has to work with Japanese and French and everything else, and it does. And the only rules are it starts with column 13. Everything up to that point is well known. And then those are raw UTF-8 bytes. And then they end with a carriage return, a backslash n. And there's, there, you're not allowed to encode a backslash n in a file name uh, in our system. Uh, the Mac, in all their brilliant uh, wisdom, allowed that to occur, but we actually just uh, pack it w with a, with our own little method, and, and we don't allow it. Um, but uh, so it's very very simple. It's very very fast. There's no decoding. You don't have to JSON encode it. You don't have to XML encode it. You don't have to HTML encode it. It's just raw bytes. Okay. So this is a plus sign in column one means that we're adding a file to the backup. A minus sign in column one means that that file has disappeared from your laptop. But a minus sign does not mean we purge it from the data center. An X line means we've now purged that file from the data center. So what normally happens is a file is added, that's a plus. Sometime later, you delete that file from your laptop, that'll be a minus. And 30 days later, an X will appear when it is purged from the data center. If the X isn't in this file, it's still in the data center. Anyway, so, so that's that. Um, in column one, then, there are a couple more interesting characters. Uh, that is the way we think about the whole system. Plus, minus, and X. That's all we think of. The, the, the details are a little more subtle. And one of the details is the equals sign. So an equals is a deduplication. If you have the same file contents twice on your laptop, we dedupe. I had to build this in right at the beginning of the client because I didn't know how to handle when you'd moved a folder. And so if you just rename a folder, Backblaze, the, 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 program, the backup program, the client on your laptop, wakes up and it profoundly has no idea that you renamed that folder. And what it does is it says, oh my gosh, you've deleted a bunch of files from the old folder location and it issues a bunch of minuses. And then it says, oh, I've got a new folder here I've never seen before. And it issues a bunch of pluses for the new, for the new files. But instead of doing pluses, it's able to do an equal sign, which is a deduplication. And it, it doesn't have to transmit it into the data center again. It just uses um, what's called column four. And we'll go into column four in great detail here in a second. Column four is the file ID that completely identifies in the data center where that file is, where it lives. So, so the equal sign utilizes column four. 
So going back to line one, when, it, when we pushed into the data center, it's a plus sign. The column three is the date. There's a few flags in column two. I'm just going to skip over for a second. Column three is the date time that this was issued on the laptop. So um, this is when the event occurred. Now, the earlier file formats that I screwed up, I tried to combine some of these columns together, and it just, it just ended up being a debacle so, so, and really complicated. So the, the, the column three is very, very simple. It'll always sort of be monotonically increasing. It's in GMT. It's in London UTC time. And it's um, when the event occurred, when this line was added to this file. Uh, the next line, column four, is, is where all the magic is. And this has a four underbar at the start of it. This is, a, this is an ID of where it is in the world, where the file is stored. And I can point to the exact pod it's stored on based on this ID. And it's, there's no redirection, and it's totally simple because we didn't have time to build anything complicated. Um, the number four means we screwed it up three times. So this is the fourth version of this, of this ID. So the four, underbar, and then there's an H. This is the host globally unique identifier. It's called an H good at our company. Uh, in B2, it became a bucket ID. It's 24 characters long, it's hexadecimal, and, um, and it uniquely identifies your backup in the whole world. Um, but that's not where it is in the data center, but this it, it identifies who owns this file in the data center. Um, then there's an underbar and an F. There's a 16 digits here of hexadecimal. You'll see zeros in almost all of them always because this is uh, uh, a monotonically increasing file ID that just that we use to make sure it's different from all the other ones. Then there's the day, minutes, and seconds. So if you see the D, it says D, and then 2014 was the year, 05 is the month, 10 is the day, and then underbar minutes is hours, minutes, and seconds. That this file of when the file landed in the data center. So when I said earlier that I confused the columns earlier, I tried to I tried to save some space by combining column three and that column, but it's a mistake because when you dedupe, the, the time that you had the dedupe line is radically different than the time that it was, it was put in the data center. You dedupe years later against a file that was pushed earlier. And so that's why I, I, I started by combining those and that was a total screw up and it was hard to understand the code and everything. And now it's all, it's all sorted out. So this just refers to the, the, when this exact data was pushed into the data center, not the particular line anymore. Okay, so hours, minutes, and seconds that was pushed. And then here is where the magic of where it is in the data center. C001 mean it's, means it's on cluster one. And so the C001, since users can never move between clusters, this C001 will be that way in every line of every busy done file. And that sounds uh, wasteful, but, and, and that's why, again, I screwed up earlier and didn't do that, but it just turns out that every once in a while, some crazy user will actually copy some of the lines from one of their users and paste them into a different file. And that is a debacle. Um, this is the, I have this idea of doing this blog post on paranoid programming. You think that your, the, your world operates on a certain number of rules, then you find out that the laptops have bad RAM in them. Or a user is just batshit insane and has decided, they go, no, 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 I figured out your file format. I don't have to re-push my files. I'll copy and paste these, these lines over into this other client. And it's like, that didn't push the files. That just profoundly lost the files, you know, so th this is the kind of thing. So anyway, this C001 is the cluster you're in. V is the vault that it's on. So this is vault 645. Um, T is the tome, which is one, a tome is a group of these 20 drives, uh, 20 drives in 20 separate machines. And then, uh, uh, so it's vault, it's a CVT, cluster, vault, tome. And, and that'll identify exactly where your data is in the data center in one of the data centers worldwide. Um, and these are completely worldwide uh, 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 file IDs. Um, we can just look through it and everything's great. Um, column five, uploaded member pod. It turns out the client talks to one of the 20 pods in the vault and uploads the file. This just happened to record which member pod it uploaded to. I didn't know if it was gonna be important or not. Now we have it, now it's, that's where it was. It can also help debug problems in the future if, if there was one bad pod that had bad RAM in it or something like that. It would help explain what was going on. Um, you can also do statistical analysis about whether it, 
pods have been talked to more than other pods. Um, column six is the is is very very important. It's the unique identifier of column 13. So column 13 is the file name on your laptop. We don't know your file names. They're absolutely encrypted and we're not allowed to know them. So column, uh, we assign every one of the files on your laptop a unique monotonically increasing number which is stored in column 6. It identifies the file name. If you rename a file, it gets a new a new uh, 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 name, and this is also how we do the 30-day rollback history. Any file name for for the hit for if you assign a file like c colon backslash dog dot jpeg, you assign that file ID three. It's got to be three for the rest of time. So it, you can delete that file, wait four years, and then recreate a new dog dot jpeg in that same spot. It's got to get that same. Uh, file ID back. And that allows us to do the 30-day rollback history. We can say, oh my gosh, th without knowing the file names. Oh my gosh, this file ID was created at this time, and this file ID got a minus sign later. But we don't actually know your file name, if that made any sense. So, okay. And then, um, and then column seven is some internal stuff I'll get to in a second. SHA-1. Column eight is the SHA-1. So SHA-1 is a checksum. It helps us verify that the contents of the data, this is the, the SHA-1 of the original file, and this is how we do deduplication. A SHA-1 is basically you run all of, the, all of the bytes in a file through this algorithm, and it comes up with a unique number. And SHA-1s are very, very unique. They're not infinitely unique, and so there could be it's theoretically possible to have collisions. That's why we don't dedupe in this system. Um, we don't dedupe across between accounts. We only dedupe inside of your one laptop. And so that reduces the chance. We've actually never seen a, a, a collision. Um, and, and, uh, and, it, and it would be very, di it'd be very difficult to have a collision. But anyway, column 9 and 10 are the creation time of the file on your laptop and the last modified time on your laptop. People really, um, we use the last modified time to know when a file has changed. So we rerun through these files when we're going to do a backup, and we say, oh, this file, dog, had a mod time that has now changed, and therefore we will go ahead and look at the contents and see if we want to back it up. Um, the, we also use it when we restore people a lot of people think of the last mod time or the creation time as very important information. Like uh, when you restore all your photos, uh, some some photo organization apps organize them by time. Most photo organization apps organize them by creation time. And for instance, all of your wedding photos were taken on the same day, so we can group those together and know what's going on. But if we lost that information, then you couldn't you couldn't restore the data fully. So this is envelope information outside of the, the file. And then, um, and then the file name, as I talked about. OK, the last little subtlety that I want to talk about today, and then I'm almost done, is uh, large files. So we originally, um, any file that's a plus and a minus and, and just has a you know, dog at the end or cat, any, any file that is less than 30 megabytes, we just push as an entire file. Any deltas, we just push a whole new file. There's no sub-deltas, there's no sub-diffing you know, diffing between them, and there are no parts to that file. That's a simple file, that's a small file, what we call a small file. Any file larger than 30 megabytes on your laptop, we break into 10 megabyte chunks. And we did this for a variety of reasons. Um, we wanted a, a size that we could successfully transmit over the internet in 2007 and be sure that it would complete on relatively slow internet connections. We can't, and I, I, and every, I've been asked by other people that have done backup clients, they're like, why'd you pick 10? And I'm like, I don't know. I just pulled it out of, my, out, of the, out of the air. I have no idea why I picked it. And I'm like, what did you pick? And they went, I picked five, but I don't know why either. So none of us know what we're doing. Um, 10 is a perfectly reasonable chunk. What we have, uh, over the years, what we have seen is HTTPS is, um, uh, there's a certain amount of overhead with negotiating the connection before we can push it over the, uh, over the internet. There's also this thing, on, that this completely depraved and evil thing called uh, TCP slow start, uh, which, which the internet guys think is great because it's protecting the internet, but it means that until a file transmits at least 40 megabytes, 
you're not getting the full transmission speed. So if you're in Australia, you start transmitting very, very slowly and you wait till you get the acknowledgements and you start speeding up and you see that everything's going well and about 40 megabytes in, you're getting the full transmission speed. So the 10 megabyte files is not quite big enough, I, but it's, it's not gonna change now. Um, um, but I did reserve, I did some reserve some space in this file format. In column seven, it's a uh, zero if it's a self-contained file, and it's a five, a five if it's 10 megabytes. Those are the only two values. But I reserved one, two, three, four for less than 10 megabytes, which we're never gonna do because that would be a mistake. But I reserved six, seven, eight, nine for larger than 10 megabytes. So we could move to a larger uh, file chunk size. It would just be a lot of code and it would be a lot of differences and stuff. So because 10 megabytes is not large enough to get the maximum transmission speed on the internet from Australia or New Zealand, uh, we added threading to the client. So um, you can run up to 20 individual threads. So um, this, this, this is why TCP slow start offends me. Everyone in the world knows there's this problem. So instead of making each thread faster like they should have, everyone adds multiple threads. But that's just stupid. Like, why, you're, you're talking from Australia all the way to a server in Sacramento, and you have one thread, and your bandwidth that you have is 10 megabytes or, or, or uh, 100 megabits or a gigabit, and we have a, a gigabit, but you need 10 threads to take advantage of that. And that just doesn't make any sense to me. It just seems like you should be able to get the maximum throughput from one thread. Um, and in other news, we've never seen an internet thread go faster than a gigabit, and we don't know why. One thread cannot go past a, a gigabit on the internet. So if you want to get 100 uh, uh, a gigabit uh, transmission speed, you have to go to multiple threads. And we don't know why. I don't know why. No one knows why. No one that I've talked to knows why. Um, so anyway, so, so uh, what we're talking about is large files. So large files have... have um, they, they, they push a bunch of plus signs for every one of the chunks of the large fi file, which are in column seven are fives. K5s means that it's um, a, uh, a chunk size of 10, 10 megabytes. Um, it, each one of those has the same file name at the end here, you'll see. And oh, and uh, column 12 is actually the number of bytes in the file. Uh, in a previous company, we kept getting bitten by bytes versus megabytes versus kilobytes and the round off errors and everyone argued about it. So I made sure all these file formats were in a raw number of bytes so that you couldn't argue. It, 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 you know, I, I don't have any religion around it. It's just, um, it, so this is a 234 byte file is in column 12 here at the top. And um, that's the dog.jpg. Okay, so there's an extra couple of columns on files that are large files that have a CF, and that's a chunk file ID for each of the chunks inside of this file called pig. Each one of the chunks will be the same size except for the last chunk. Okay, so what happens in a large file if a large file, if you change something inside of it? Well, the worst thing you could possibly do to our system is prepend one byte to the file because uh, we will. By definition, we can't dedupe, we dedupe on the 10 megabyte boundaries period. Um, and we can dedupe again between files with, with different 10 megabyte chunks. We can dedupe any chunks against standalone files. But, um, but the point is that we dedupe, deduping, um, and, and the chunks are all 10 megabytes. So all of the, if you inserted a byte at the start, it would shift the file down and it would destroy the whole file. You have to retransmit the whole file because it's all different now. The best thing you can do is append one byte to the end of a file, because if you append a byte to the end of the file, only the last chunk changes. We only have to transmit the last chunk of the file. Um, and then there's an exclamation point in line column one here, which is means um, that's the meta line that summarizes everything about that large file. So in the, in the case of this uh, pig here, the, the file name pig, there, it transmitted one, two, three, four, five chunks of pig. It, then, it, then it listed this summary line with an exclamation point. And there are a couple of things about that line that are unique and you'll find interesting. Um, there is no data center uh, location in that, in that set of columns. You notice the F, the dashes here under F and D and M. That's because a meta line doesn't exist in the data center. It's just a summary of the total file, you know, the, the size of the, that file who happens to be pig in this case. Um, and then, uh, and then the chunks are each given a monotonically increasing number in column seven. You can see it's K5 N000, 001, 002, 003, 004, 005. So, so um, 
the other the other reason to pick a slightly larger chunk size would be it lowers the number of chunks, which lowers the size of the data structures, um, you know, that we have to maintain for various things. But anyway, but 10 megabytes is actually taking care of us as a company. It's been a very reasonable trade-off. The slowest dial-up modems can manage to get 10 megabytes transmitted in a reasonable amount of time, let's say a couple hours. And, um, and the fastest, you know, machines that are pretty close to our data center can get pretty high bandwidth out of that. Um, people can, can use it. Basically, worldwide, you can exceed any upstream consumer uh, bandwidth right now. So as long as you don't have Google Fiber, the, the, the client is not your bottleneck. It's going to be your disk or your, your bandwidth or, or something like that, which is the, the bottleneck and the client. Um, we can easily exceed like 50 megabits up. And most consumer uh, bandwidth, even 12 years later after we founded the company, 20 megabits up is a, is a really good, uh, you know, you know U United States ISP uh, bandwidth. Morgan. Morgan is asking, why is the backup fast, or why, you know, why, why is it, why is it perceived that way? There's two or three or four parts of that. One is um, the client was absolutely designed to survive and be reasonably lightweight and run in the background. It was designed to run in the background and never be uninstalled and just run constantly in continuously mode, and that was that was its forte. And so it was designed for 5,400 RPM drives in laptops in 2007, which is what I owned. Um, modern hard drives are 7,200 RPM, and most people have moved over to SSDs and laptops. And so it's lightweight and doesn't bother you because it's still running designed for this slower set of machines. And one of the reasons it's lightweight is because it runs slower. It, 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 it's, it's not just about the CPU load. Um, when we index the drive, uh, we're not CPU bound at all, but what we do is the process that indexes the drive is called BZ file list. It actually just sleeps every few seconds for like four or five seconds to allow other crap in your system to do stuff and to not create an und un un a bad load on your, on your drive. So it's all designed to be lightweight. The faster side of it, um, a lot of these uh, backup software that build for $5 a month unlimited or, you know, or $6 or $7 a month unlimited, they didn't want it to go fast because, and, and the most famous cases like Carbonite, they backed up your first 50 megabytes or 50 gig very, very quickly, and then they slowed it down called throttling. It was brilliant, really. So they said that they had unlimited uh, storage that you were allowed to store, but you could never get two terabytes uploaded because it would take five, six, seven years. So, and, and it was all artificial, and they got sued for it, and they had to stop doing that. So they got sued for false advertising. Uh, early on, there were a few reviewers who, instead of evaluating the product like I liked, which is, once the initial backup is over, and once it's in steady state, how much does it load your computer, and does it stay up to date? That's how I think you should evaluate a backup you know, software. The reviewers would install different backup software and measure how fast and how much they could saturate your bandwidth and overload your hard drive. And they, they claimed that the more it was overloading your bandwidth in your hard drive, the better the backup product was. And, and um, I thought that was silly, but it was one of the things that reviewers did. And so as, over time, we got, we took the risk and we went ahead and added threads and we made it fast and we hoped that it wasn't going to be a mistake. And it allowed, you know, we, by default, we use four threads. And it's a really reasonable default for most people that does really, really well. And if they go in and customize it, they can go as high as 20 threads. Um, and we might even increase that for January to 30 threads because it, it doesn't really hurt us. People are getting fully backed up. We're not defeating anyone by, you know, keeping the thread count low. Um, and it's a way of getting, a, you know, making even more people happy and getting better reviews and stuff. Um, but um, I don't know why it's, why it's, you know, fast and lightweight. Um, I think some of the decisions we made, oh, we also batch small files together. So because there's this fixed overhead with setting up an HTTPS connection, when you, tra in, the, in the very, when we first launched the product, when you transmitted a one byte file, you would set up this entire connection to the data center, you would send one byte, and then you would tear it down. And that means that small files would get very low throughput compared to larger files. And so what, the first thing we added before we added threading is we added batching, where we batched up to 999 small files together to get the, the performance up. So I think, I think there's a variety of things. I think it's the language it's written in is also an efficient language. It's C. It's, it's a dead language. And, and you'd probably never do it again in this, in this you know, format. But it, 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 is, it is fast. Um, 
Uh, and there are other things that we could do even faster. Um, you know, every once in a while, like a network engineer will, will, you know, look at the protocol and decide that, you know, we could be 3% faster if we did something differently. And, and I always go like, I'll get right on that. You know, like, what am I working on this week? Single sign on, you know, we work on installers and downloaders and iOS clients. You know, we can't, we can't spend all of our time, you know, working on the performance aspect of it. But I, I do like the fact that it's, it, it's efficient and it's lightweight and I still run the actual product. So, you know, I, 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 I still, you know, like it enough to run it. So, and that's exactly an hour. How was it? Uh, 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 any other questions that people have? I'm here all week. Morgan. Yeah. Okay. In, um, in B2, it is absolutely not a problem because B2 is a completely, you know, we charge for the number of bytes stored. So that's one of the reasons we also love B2. Also, Hard drives are getting uh, cheaper by 1% every month. And this has been true over almost our entire history. So, um, so, so our costs go down by 1%. Now, in the B1 product, people store 2% more data every month than they did before. So our margin is eroding by 1% a month, 12% a year. Now, we've, we've had other efficiencies. We've gotten cheaper data centers. We've learned better dedupe. Te technology we have better we have better dedupe technology so we fought that fight as long as we could and we're going to lose it in uh, february 2nd uh of 2019 we're going to raise uh prices of b1 by a dollar uh by 20 percent which will buy us of margin you know and and the profit percent margin the cost of goods sold it, it, cogs is what is what the industry calls it the cost of goods sold um, includes the electricity in the band in, in the data center the hard drives in the data center the employees in the data center salaries is all part of what we consider the cost of goods sold the margin is what we pay my salary out of so it's not that it's just free money it's still necessary it's what we pay the developers because the developers are considered a one-time cost once they finish developing they're done uh, realistically, we know that that, yeah, AB is laughing in the back. So realistically, we all know as developers that you have to maintain the stuff. You have to chase the OS developers like we're doing with Mojave this week. So whether or not that's an honest calculation, that's the way it's done in the industry. So but we still spend 100%. So we can't really go much below. But yeah, so it is a problem that, um, that people are storing more data every month. And, uh, and, and, and we just have to watch that and, and figure it out. Oh, storage was outgrowing sales. And so the question was, was that a problem? And, and the reason storage is outgrowing sales, there's, there's two, the answer was just twofold. It, people are storing more data and that's a problem for B1, but it's not a problem for B2 at all. And it won't outpace sales when it's one-to-one, -one. when it's all B2 sales, then it would, it would, it would match. Um, but it's not a problem because we actually, um, storage gets less expensive. That's part of that curve of why storage is growing faster, but our, but our sales is going flat as storage is literally getting less expensive. Oh, while we have price increases for B1 planned, we have price decreases for B2 in the budgets, in the planned in the future. So every year or something, we're going to drop the price of B2 from now on to, to, to match, you know. So, so th these two product lines, B1 and B2, actually make the same margin. We're, we're, at this point, we're completely agnostic where our revenue comes from. Uh, people think that we, we're on the, on the internet, sometimes people think we're pushing them toward B2, and they, they perceive B1, like a guy will have four, the break-even point right now is one terabyte. If you have one terabyte of data, you can use B1 or B2, and, you, and it costs you the same thing, you know, $5 a month. And but people with four terabytes will show up and go, you're trying to push me into B2. You know, that, that's your plan all along, and it's, it's really not true. We don't, we don't really care which one you're in. It's just that B2 has a lot more customization. They'll say, I want a bigger rollback history, and I want B1. And it's like, yeah, for $5 a month, you don't get any customization. So stuff like that. Uh, very good question. Okay, so the question was, um, when this file, this busy done file, is sent to the CA, but uh, we also made the claim that we don't know the file names. So there's, um, what, we, what we do is we, we split this file into two halves. We split it into everything before column, I think, uh, column nine or something, even the, the file mod times and file create times we don't know. And the, 
everything to the right, nine and to the right is encrypted with the same encryption that your files are. And so if you set a private encryption key, we literally can't decode it. We have no idea what it is. Now, all the other columns are actually uploaded just compressed. Just, uh, it's text, so we, so simple zip compression gives us 10 to 1 compression in the CAs. We have to buy less disks, so, and it's a little, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but it's, it's one-tenth the amount of disks that we have to buy. So, um, so because of that, there were two halves, and for a while, these were two separate files in the data center. And then, if you ever hear us talk at this company about the BC COM files, C-O-M-B, that's because they're, uh, because we combined them back together again. So actually the plain text half and the encrypted half are bundled into one bundled file in the data center. We can only read half of it without your password. And we read the other half of it with your password or with, with your private encryption key. And, um, and the reason we combined them was for I.O. reasons. Running across all of the files to back them up onto a separate server was twice as many IOPS if we didn't have them combined into one. And they really are the same file. It, one of them doesn't make sense without the other one. And so, and the reason it's, it's COMB, and I'm, 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 in, um, I'm, I'm emphasizing this for, for the reason of the screw up that happened. COMB is the same number of letters as, as to do and done. So, it, so all of these files, we just never wanted to change the length of the file name, and we wanted to combine them together, and so now they're always, they're, they're comb files. But a busy done file and a comb file, we just think of them as the same thing. One, you know, one of them you can read, the busy done file you can read without your password, and that exists on the client's laptop. It's, on every one of your laptops, you can go in and read these files of what, what's happened. And then in the data center, the file names are all encrypted until you, when you go to browse the tree, oh, oh, and then, and then when you go to prepare a restore in B1, what you're literally browsing in the tree browsing view is this file. This is what you're browsing. So you can look at your laptop and see what you would have, you know, seen in the tree browsing server, or you can, you can go onto the tree browsing server and log in and see it. It's the same thing. It's just browsing these files. That's what it's doing. Um, it's very, very simple. Anything else? Anything else? All right. So what, this is a lot of information about B1, and most of you don't care. Um, and that's fine, as, as if you do have, like, the support people care because they have to dig into these, um, and some of the engineers care, and um, uh, as, you, uh, as you, you know, continue on, you want to know more information, we can dig into more. The, there is some subtlety to these file formats and how you interpret them and how you reassemble files, large files, how it takes to reassemble them and stuff like that. So, so and then... Uh, some of you I've seen now four times in this presentation. Um, it just repeat it. It just it's nothing. No one can get all of this in you know in one shot, and so you just watch it over and over again. All right. Thank you, everyone. And then, then this is we're we're all done for the remote people. But we're um uh, uh the normal thing to follow this on is then how does B two work? And and that's what the the talk that AB could give at some other time. But um, B two uh retain the same one account login, but instead of having BZ done files, they have the Cassandra database. So one of the flaws of the BZ done, which is really, 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 really profound is, if you just wanted to identify one file, you literally have to look through all the BZ done's for it. It's not indexed on a file name basis. So you just have to like do a flat list through, and it could be, yeah, it could be 100 million lines if you have 100 million files. So Cassandra, it, you know, is much, much, much more expensive than this, but it has these advantages, which is it, you can look up an, ind an individual named file and, um, and, but that's not, yeah, it's a, it's a different application. Cassandra is this cool database where there are, what are do you have any idea how, how many nodes were? Individual one use servers with all the data kind of spread around where much like our vaults, you can lose any one or two, I don't know what the redundancy is on those things. You can lose one or two of the Cassandra nodes and the database is entirely still up and fine, and you can read all the data out of it. So the, the CA is still a single point. When you lose the power supply in the CA or, or whatever, then it's down and you have to repair it or you lose the file system. But Cassandra's cool. It stays up much higher. But it's a little more expensive because you've got to buy more nodes. If you filled a cluster with 100% B2 data, it would need something like 200 uh, Cassandra nodes in order to run. But we, we have, as Elliot convinced me, that um, 
this is not only plausible, this has been done at other companies, that, that, that Cassandra scales up that big. And so one of the, one of the ideas of the, of the cluster architecture is the cluster has to be built to scale to a certain size then you stamp out more clusters. And that's how we scale. And we, we believe we have sort of solved that problem, that, that that will just keep stamping out clusters forever. We don't have to worry about that. We are having, like, um, in B2, a few customers have more than a billion files in a bucket. And it's working, uh, but Cassandra, the design, we have to, like, tweak that up a little. So there is scale work to do left at Backblaze. Um, but but we believe it's mostly solved. There used to be a day where the 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 the, the cluster authority would, when we only had one, would fall over, and we were just up all night trying to get more performance out of the system and reoptimizing, and it was and it was painful, and everyone just hated, you know, the fact that if if we got if we were successful and a bunch of people signed up, we would also go out of business, um, and and so we it yeah. Um, we, we have a joke at Backblaze where we would say, but luckily we never grew that fast. Um, but it's also unfortunate that we never grew that fast. So, so we think we're, we're ahead of all of these problems and, and we're really in a good place right now where we can stamp out more of these things. Um, the other weird thing about our business that, that I, I'm fascinated by was when we only had uh, a 1,000 customers, 10 people in the company, that's two guys a year. So early on, a lot of the growth, all these people that you see around here all came in the last, like when did, Tina, when did you start? Three months ago. <laughs> so so um, all this growth really picks up. And what I don't understand is, where were all these customers earlier? Like, it's the same product, essentially. I mean, B2 is a different product than that. We couldn't have had the B2 business. But B1, look at B1. We've had the same product for all these years. And, and from a, a customer perspective, I mean, we had to grow it internally and we added a few features. But, but like, it, let's say there's like, like um, 45 million customers that would benefit in the world top that would benefit from this product. Why can't I have those all tomorrow? Why do I have to wait? But for some reason, it's like the product is ever so slightly vir viral. It's like everyone tells all their friends about it like once every five years or something like that. <laughs> so so um, I don't know. I just I find it really interesting. Like where, where is that 50% growth going to come from next year when it's more money than we've ever made? You know, but it, it just keeps coming like that. It just keeps, you know, unloading on us. It, anyway. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, remote people.